Good morning. So I'm going to start my presentation. Of course, I'm thanking Mira Marcus, and I'm thanking all of you also for being here. Um, I want to start my presentation now by just quickly reviewing what I did last year at this same conference. And I talked about extremophiles and lessons from nature. And I sort of played on this concept of publishing a paper in nature and what that meant. And it was based on ex my work with extremophiles in which I was studying organisms living in boiling sulfuric acid. And we went, it's a bit too loud, aren't we went to places where these organisms exist. This is Kamchatka in the Russian Far East. And these are organisms living in hot springs, in geothermal hot springs, where in this particular case, there's a glacier running into the hot spring. So this is quite different than the Dead Sea, which is saturated salt. But it's the same kinds of organisms, the so-called archaea, that are thriving in these environments. So the pH at this particular site is around 2. The water temperature is around 85 or 90 degrees Celsius. And the organisms that live there, like Sophilobus shabatai, as Mila showed this slide, produce a protein structure that's extremely interesting. And when I sequenced the gene that coded for that protein, it turned out to be related to a eukaryotic protein, to a yeast and a human protein. And I published it in Nature, and I had a cover on the issue. And it was a big deal until I discovered that this paper was wrong. So the lesson from Nature was that I, my science that I did was correct. But the concept, the notion that heat shock proteins are part of a molecular chaper or are called molecular chaperones or part of a theory about molecular chaperones proved to be wrong because we showed later and published in Proceedings of the National Academy that these proteins, rather than folding other proteins, which is what the molecular chaperone theory says, these proteins were involved in stabilizing the cell membrane. So just as we heard from the previous speaker, the membrane and the cell wall is a critical component of biological systems. In any case, that's what I talked about last year. But I want to shift gears now and tell you about what's happened to me in the last 10 years that has focused my attention on lessons from nature, but other kinds of extreme conditions. And my title for this talk is The Taken for Granted Supply Chain. And by the end of the talk, I hope this will be clear to you what, what exactly that means. So this story started um, in part with work that I was doing during the Obama administration in the Office of Science, Technology, and Policy in a group called the Interagency Water, Energy, and Actually Food Nexus. And there were a lot of different people involved in this project, from the OSTP to the CIA, to the Department of Defense, to the Department of Energy, Department of the Interior, the EPA, the EOP. I was the NASA representative. NOAA was there. The National Science Foundation was there. The State Department was there. The Treasury had representatives. The USAID, the US Department of Agriculture. We were all there. And what we were doing is we were looking at the world in the year 2030, what would the world be like? What would it be like, now it's only 11 years from now, back then it was 15 years, so it wasn't distant future. What would the world be like in the year 2030? And all of what we were focused on was the fact that we're going to need a lot more food, about 35% more food, a lot more water, and a lot more energy. And I cut my talk fairly short to be able to focus on the reality of what's going on globally. But because the audience here understands, I didn't go into too much detail about the background and how we got into this predicament. But the Earth right now is facing, and we, specifically the people, the younger people in this room, are facing a perfect storm. And it's a function of the population growth. We're at 7.7 .7 billion people right now and estimated by the year 2030 to be 
over 8 billion, and by the year 2050, almost 10 billion. But it's not just the population problem. It's also what's called urbanization. Is this a problem? Down? Can you hear me all right in the back? OK. So urbanization is the other problem. And that is that people around the world are moving to cities. So while we had an agrarian society for, for centuries, now people are living in cities. In the United States, over 85% of the people live in cities. The biggest change, perhaps, in the last 20 years in China, it went from about 25% 20, people living in cities to now over 50%, and it continues to grow. The other part of the, this perfect storm that we're confronting and, as a species on this earth uh, is affluence. There's a change in the lifestyle that people are assuming that they should have. People are changing their diets, they're eating more meat, but they're living a more affluent, uh, in, in more affluent ways. And this combines with the last and perhaps not the least problem, which is climate change. Climate change is, is how we, as we heard a couple of days ago, is unequivocal. We've the scientific evidence is in, there's become a bit of a political issue. But as scientists, we don't need to argue this. It's, it's Schopenhauer once said that truth passes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. And third, it is taken as self-evident. So within the scientific community, climate change is self-evident. But still within the political arena, it's being violently opposed and ridiculed and etc. But all of these problems that we're confronting as an earth relate to us in terms of the food, water, and energy nexus. All of these problems, population and urbanization and affluence and climate change, all of these directly relate to the problem of the water, food, and energy, all of which are, are intimately interrelated, and those are related to the taken-for-granted supply chain. What I mean to say is that food, water, and energy are so interwoven that they build a supply chain. So for example, right here in this particular place in the Judean desert, we can only survive here because of a supply chain of food and water. And you can think of many, many examples of that. The space station is an incredible example of how we put people in an environment that is incredibly difficult to ever have a person, and they're living in a little can, and it's all about supply chain. So the supply chain is taken for granted until something runs out. So it's said that we're nine meals away from anarchy. That is to say that if we ever really ran out of food in our stores and ran out of our, our supply of food, that it wouldn't be long until people would get desperate enough to do things that would no longer be considered civilized. So let's take an inventory of where we are related to this food, water, and energy system that we're living on a planet which is 29% land and 71% water. Let's look specifically at the land component and consider that 100%. If we look at the land component of the Earth, 71% of it is considered usable, 19% of it's considered barren, and about 10% of it's still frozen. If you look at the usable land, 50% of that is already being used for agriculture, 37% is still in forests, 11% is scrubland, and about 1% is covered by water, and between 1 and 3% is already covered by human cities. Now, the next statistic to me was quite shocking. And that is, of the 50% of usable land that's now in agriculture, over three quarters of that, 77% of it, is used to support livestock. And only 23% of it is used for crops. Now, what I mean by supporting livestock is also growing crops that we feed to our livestock. And the livestock only provide about a third of our protein and about a fifth of our calories. So the question becomes, what is sustainable? Now let's look at this issue of livestock. When we think about livestock, we can think about uh, the people that have animals on, on big, big uh, prairie lands or grazing. But we also have to think about how we grow animals in 
huge concentrations, like the feedlot in this picture, or like these dairy farms that are enormous, or sheep herds, or in, not in this country, but in other countries, we have massive pig farms that are you know, huge numbers of these animals. In fact, if you look at the major mammals that are on the earth right now by weight, this is, so each of the tiles in this picture is a million tons. Well, then humans are here. Horses are this little group of tiles in the bottom. There are goats and pigs and here are sheep. And these are cattle. In the last 50 years, 60% of all the wild animals in the world have disappeared. 60% of the wild animals in the world have disappeared in the last 50 years. And that means that in this, in this representation, these green tiles, which represent some of the representative animal, wild animals, all of the elephants that are left in the world fit into a single tile. The number that's really interesting to me is the fact that there are now 19 billion chickens in the world. So there are 7.7 .7 billion humans, there are 19 billion chickens, and an additional 6 billion cows and pigs and sheep and goats. It's for a total of about 25 billion livestock domesticated animals. So what does this mean? These animals, in order to keep them alive, we feed them with about 40% of all the grain that we produce. This is enough grain to feed a million people. I'm sorry, a billion people. But we use that to feed our billions of animals. In California, the animals use about 80% of our water, when we include, of course, the, the crops that are grown to support animals. And uh, between 20% and 33%, about a third of the energy that we produce and conserve goes into grazing these animals. And what do the animals do for us? They provide milk and eggs and meat and money. Huge industry. If you look at the relative efficiency of animals in terms of their feed to food conversion ratios, that is, how many kilograms of of feed do you have to, produce, to give to one of these animals? I use pigs. I use beef and pigs and chickens as examples to produce a kilogram of food. It turns out that the number on average is about eight kilograms of feed to make one kilogram of beef. It's about four kilograms of, of feed to make one kilogram of pig. And it's about two kilograms of feed to make a kilogram of chicken. There's another group of organisms, though, that we eat on a fairly regular basis. And these are aquatic organisms, both freshwater and marine organisms that we eat in huge quantities. And they have a much higher efficiency of converting their feed to food. And this may partly be explained by the fact that they are suspended in a medium, they don't fight gravity in the same way terrestrial organisms do. They are, many of them are not keeping their bodies warm. So they're, they're living at the same temperature as their environment. But all of the organisms that we cultivate as aquaculture tend to be better than all of the other organisms that we're using on land. Uh, the Atlantic salmon, for example, is about 1.4 kilograms of feed to make a kilogram of salmon. So it's also true, though, of shrimp and catfish and carp and tilapia. They're much more efficient at turning their feed into food. Keep this in mind, because this will be part of the equation that we're going to talk about from now on. So let's talk about the lessons from nature. What we've learned very clearly, and what I've been focused on now for the last 10 years, is that this linear process that we've been going through of harvesting natural resources and turning them into products and waste is, an, is, a, is not a, a sustainable model. We need to create ecosystems. What we learn from nature is that waste is just another name for a resource at another level within the system. So in a totally simplistic model, what we see on, on, on the right-hand side of this slide is that 
wastes from the production of products from natural resources become resources for another area within the ecosystem that we're describing. So how can we translate this into something that we could use as a sustainable food, water, and energy model? Let me walk you through a diagram, which is overly simplified, but meant to convey the same notion of an ecosystem. And let me mention also that there's one other component of the system that, I, uh, that we really, really have to keep in mind, and that is that, that our society is based on economics. And in order to build a functional system, we're going to have to include an economic component to this, and it has to generate profit. There has to be a return on investment. So in considering the food cycle, these organisms are also producing huge quantities of waste. So uh, in the United States, for example, there's a million tons of manure produced per day, about 320 million tons of manure produced per year. This massive quantity of manure is basically the inefficiency of the digestion of these organisms, and so the residual material is still useful in many ways. We know, of course, you can use it to, as a fertilizer. Um, it provides nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in the soil, and it can be used through anaerobic digestion to make both fertilizer in the form of what's called digestate and livestock bedding, and, of course, biogas. So by using an anaerobic digester, we have a pathway towards methane. There are other pathways we can follow towards hydrogen. But we can make, from this waste material, we can make energy and fertilizer. And in the process, we produce carbon dioxide. So you know, of course, that methane is a greenhouse gas, but we're now burning the methane and turning it into carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is, of course, a greenhouse gas, but in the model that we're proposing, that carbon dioxide and the fertilizer that we're producing is going into growing microalgae. The microalgae are the fastest growing plants on the planet, and they provide a feed that includes a fatty acid called omega-3 that is, when, feed, when fed to cows, goes into milk, and when fed to chickens, goes into eggs, and when fed to animals in general, changes the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3, and is good in the quality of the meat and the eggs and the milk. So it increases the value. And normally, omega-3 is, is, is got from fish meal, is gotten from fish meal to give to these animals, but the fish get their omega-3 from the algae. So what have I built here? I've built a kind of ecosystem that includes an aquaculture component where the algae also become a feed for the aquaculture as well as producing oxygen that can be captured to increase the productivity of the aquaculture. The aquaculture in turn is producing a nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium producing fertilizer, and that's an aquaponics model. So there's one other element that we now in the 21st century should be thinking about when we try to design such an ecosystem all of the parts of which are completely known. There are people now working on the manure to anaerobic digester. This is actually quite common. There are people who are looking at using what's called digestate that comes out of the anaerobic digester to grow algae, using manure to grow algae. Obviously, there's aquaponics, which is fish waste to grow algae. All of the components of this are known. What we can add to the, to the equation now I call augmented intelligence, or maybe we call it AI instead of AI. But what augmented intelligence is, is that we use AI, which is data, man, you know, data mining and machine learning. We use AI, but we also use business intelligence, which we're fairly sophisticated now in terms of using business intelligence. We could use creative intelligence, which is CI. We can use decision intelligence, DI. And decision intelligence basically captures the, our collective knowledge of what we, what we would need to be able to make such a system work. And then we would want to include EI, which is environmental intelligence. 
So the component of this closed loop system, or not quite closed, but this loop that I've created, is meant to include an augmented intelligent component. So if we think of what current farms look like, many of them with livestock include an anaerobic digester. How could we build such a system? Well, one proposition is that we actually add a pond to an area where there's an anaerobic digester, either near the anaerobic digest or on a farm. And this pond becomes the place where we grow algae using a system that I call the Omega system. Now, I worked on the Omega project, which was a $10.8 million project funded by NASA and the California Energy Commission for a number of years. And let me just quickly show you a video about that project. The project is called Omega. It's for coastal cities. Let me tell you how it works. Omega uses protected bays like San Francisco Bay, vast areas which will get even bigger with sea level rise. And most importantly, they already have wastewater treatment plants that currently dump wastewater into the bays. But for Omega, this wastewater is a resource, redirected into floating clear plastic tubes to grow microalgae, the fastest growing plants on the planet and the best producers of oil. The algae grow using nutrients in wastewater and they use concentrated CO2 from a source like flue gas, which means Omega treats wastewater and captures and controls a major greenhouse gas. The Omega infrastructure is used for solar electricity and concentrated solar thermal. And in some locations, wave power generators and wind turbines will also provide power. In addition to energy, the Omega offshore platform supports aquaculture and produces high quality food without using land and without using water. In fact, saving water is a big deal. It's estimated that by the year 2030, half of all the people in the world will face water shortages. And the current map of water scarcity shows in red that there are already many places in desperate need of clean water. Adapting methods developed for the space station for recycling water, Omega transforms wastewater into clean water using one third the energy required to make clean water from seawater. Omega improves the environment by treating wastewater and capturing CO2. It increases the availability of clean drinking water by recycling wastewater, it supplies food without competing with agriculture, and it provides solar energy as electricity, heat, and biofuels. All things that help move us toward a green economy and a sustainable society. It's not just a bunch of cartoons. We actually designed a system and built a system. And in this very brief video, I can show you well, the kinds of things we did. And the California Energy Commission. And the, and the Omega research team did a lot. We engineered floating plastic bioreactors to grow algae that cleaned wastewater and made biofuels. We built remote control systems and developed harvesting methods. We studied the strength and durability of critical materials, the fluid dynamics of different designs, the effects of biofouling and of cleaning, the impact of toxins from wastewater, and the role of pests that eat algae on the system's productivity. Basically, we monitored, measured, and manipulated everything we could think of for laboratory and tank experiments. And we did some experiments offshore to explore the impact of Omega on the marine environment and the impact of the marine environment on Omega. We also did techno-economic analyses to determine the returns on investments for products and services from Omega. I summarize this work in my TED Global Talk. And you can find links to our publications on our Facebook page. This Omega system is the answer to sustainability for coastal cities. So the problem with the Omega project was that it was intended to be built and deployed offshore. 
And the access to the offshore environment has proved, and I can tell you from firsthand experience, around the world to be extremely difficult. Who has jurisdiction over that space? In particular, it's often the case that it's a politician or some government official, um, people who are very risk averse for some technology that has never ever been done before other than in a fairly small scientific demonstration project. But what I was proposing in upcycle systems in the system I was describing to you is to build an algae system along with a water treatment system in the anaerobic digester and livestock and add to that the aquaculture component which could be done as a recirculating aquaculture system facility, a RAS system, as well as this idea of fertilizer production and augmented intelligence. So what we're proposing in this ecosystem is a food cycle and a fertilizer cycle as well as a water cycle in addition to an energy cycle and the goal by building these types of symbiotic systems is to create a facility where we upcycle what are currently wastes. And as I said, all the parts of this are already being done somewhere in the world, but they're not all being brought together from what I've been able to find out so far. So we're looking for places to deploy the first system. And let me just quickly show you what example of what we have in mind. We're looking at this energy, food, and water combination. And we've been looking in various places around the world. But we've started looking in an area very close to where I live in California, where there's a, there's a lot of farming going on growing berries. Strawberries, raspberries, blackberries make up make up 70% of an agricultural uh, value of over $600 million a year, and they use about 80% of the water in the area. There is, a, there is a, a dairy farm in the same vicinity with a 2,700 uh, uh, head of cattle, I mean cows, and, um, and run by this fellow Lou Cog Calcogno for the last 60 years. But what's happening in California that is a perfect example of what we were trying to do with upcycle systems is seawater is intruding into the groundwater because the farmers have removed so much of the, of the, of the aquifer that seawater has been moving inland and we've been monitoring it since 1944, this progressive march of seawater inshore. And now it's reached about four miles inland all the way up to Salinas. And the way this works is that as the farmers are pumping fresh water out of the aquifer, the salt water and the, sea and, the, and the aquifer, the balance that occurs between the two pushing in opposite directions is being won out by the seawater, which is moving inland and producing brackish water. So what we're proposing is to say, rather than build this system with a freshwater component, we do marine algae. We pump this brackish water out of the ground so now the, the ocean is coming to us. We're using desalination to make fresh water and seawater. We're using that for marine aquaculture, marine algae, and we still have an anaerobic digester, fertilizer, and livestock. So if we were going to build this somewhere in the world where there's good supplies or a, a, an active livestock industry, anaerobic digesters, where there's expertise in algae cultivation and real cutting edge uh, water treatment facilities and, and some of the top aquacultures in the world uh, where fertilizer is done as fertigation and a load of other things. Um, and where augmented intelligence or AI and, B and BI and CI, DI and EI are all present, I mean, I can't think of a place better than somewhere close by. Anyway, um, I'll, I'll end my talk here and, and, and take questions. Um, this is a great quote from Voltaire. He said, I don't judge a person by what they know, but by the questions they ask. You must. Thank you very much. Okay, please.
Um, I've got a comment in the fence of cows. What you present is only if you feed them grain, but cows can also eat grass, which is totally useless, and the equation looks totally different. Another comment on cows, if you give them, feed them omega-6 fatty acids, they chop them into bits or oxidize them. So they, they don't come out of the other side. They're going to be saturated, no matter what you stick in the front. The, o the only way to get it through, you have to coat it so they get through the stomachs into the small intestine. It's very difficult to get through. That's right. Wonderful, impressive talk, Jonathan. Um, I think, you know, one of the biggest problems we face is when we look at the simulation of climate and so on, that you make predictions and you have your challenge to validate your models. What, what you propose here would open the option that if, if one could convince a couple of countries to start individual projects like that, we could have a system of learning prototypic implementations where we learn actually and where we could model um, uh, not only the energy cycles and the, and the, the, the uh, material cycles and so on, but also the economic uh, aspects. I think that that is one aspect which, which is of utmost importance um, to have economic models tightly integrated. I yeah. totally agree with what you just said. And our business model for upcycle systems is to bring this technology to the local people, the local aquaculturist, the local algae expert, the local anaerobic digester, the local fertilizer company, and of course the local livestock producer, chicken or whatever it is. But we manage the data. So we sit on the data and for a very small fee, we accumulate information and our business model will be that we'll, we will learn quickly and using, of course, all the technology that we have, we would, then, we would then delegate out information and make sure that this system works. Look, what I learned from the uh, experience I had with that group at Office of Science, Technology and Policy was that we don't have a lot of time to figure this thing out. And we understand that there are energy wars, we've already seen some of those, but they're minor in comparison to, to wars over food and water. And this is not sort of pie in the sky, gee, maybe this is gonna happen. We, we have a perfect storm. And what we need to do is bring our ingenuity into this. And I'm so tired of hearing people tell us how horrible the circumstances are without proposing any technological fix. And I, I, you know, I'm fully aware that what, what I'm proposing has a lot of difficulties associated with it, but I would submit to you the notion that we should be doing an Apollo program or something comparable to Apollo for such a kind of project. And if we don't do it, then the next generation of people coming up are gonna go through some pretty radical times. And so, I mean, I, I I started my talk by telling you about the work that I was doing in academia, which I was really ex totally focused on about you know, heat shock proteins and studying the molecular biology of extremophiles. I was fascinated by this, but, but because of my learning about the social situation that we're in right now, this is a very crucial time in the history of humanity and we really should do something about this. Yeah. Just a, just a comment, uh, because uh, a comment was made about uh, integrating the climate models with the economic and uh, impact assessment models. It's just a very good point. It is such a good point that the Nobel Prize for Economics was given this year to that guy who actually integrates the, the Nordhaus, the climate models with the impact assessment and economic models. Yeah, so in my TED talk about the Omega Project, which was a, you know, four years of my life and $10.8 million and a big group of people that I led, I concluded that project by saying, we don't need innovation, we need integration. We have what we need, we just have to be able to put it together and work together to make it work. Okay, so let's thank all speakers. After co coffee break, okay? Because we are, thank you.